Hello, Carrie. Hey, Jared. Welcome. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm a couple minutes late. Okay, just, yeah, because I was checking Facebook Live. I'm, I'm getting ready to hop in the car, so I'm going to try to watch <laughs> watch <Well>, in Rome. <laughs> glad to have you wh while we can. Mm -hmm. um, and Tom, welcome. So uh, thank you all for joining us, and I'm sorry I'm late. It's a battery challenge. I'm not going to go into it. It's not worth it. Um, for those of you who were with us last week, thank you for your uh, input and feedback. And one of the things we learned was that... Uh, we need to make the sound better. So I'm just gonna try, because the iPad is receiving sound from these um, speakers. I'm just gonna try to turn that all the way up. And if that doesn't work, then next week, we'll try to have some extension device and get the speaker closer to the iPad. Or maybe there's some other AV technology that I just don't know about yet that we have to discover. Um, so welcome again to Grub and Gab at the Gallery, and for those of you joining virtually, we also have uh, Melissa and Anika, Anika uh, here in the gallery with us. Ruth is going to join us a little bit later, and who knows who else may come. Um, today, uh, the topic for conversation is an introduction to the case study house program, and before I say anything about it, I want to ask each of you, if you had an idea of what it was or had heard of it before I posted the concept. Anyone? Nope. Nope. No. Okay. After I posted the concept, did you do any Googling? No. No. Good. So this will be like a fresh, um, like really very introductory uh, explanation or conversation for you. I like that idea. Um, so the case study house program, and let me figure out, I'm going to push share screen so you can start to see the slideshow. The case study house program was a program of the magazine uh, architecture. Little sound interference. Uh, a program of the magazine arts and architecture. Which Are y'all hearing that or is it just me? Yes. You, you sounded good there when you asked. How are we doing now? Good. Okay. Let me know if anything weird happens again. Okay. So, um, the case study house program was uh, a program of the magazine arts and architecture which started out as california arts and architecture like in the 30s um, and the magazine evolved so the first editor and, and conceptualizers and publishers had a certain idea of what the magazine was going to be and then um it was taken over by a man named john intenza um, starting in 1940, and, and so he kind of took over the idea of it, expanded it, uh, focused it, and it became about California uh, in that they were located there, and that became a, a kind of playground for ideas, but uh, it really was, it became broader than that because the magazine over time helped define American style. So. Um, and the, the, the magazine itself was bigger than just architecture, although art, architecture was a big part of it. It was about design, landscape design, arts, um, uh, crafts, crafts, handmade stuff. Did that do something? Okay. Um, and they were, they were like on the leading edge of everything they could figure out how to be on the leading edge of. I love the idea of that. Um, they, they engaged the most talented and forward-thinking graphic designers available at the time, which was exciting. So if you look at this slide, and let's see if I can go into presentation mode or if it makes me do this like last week. Okay, looks like some of us may be coming back online. Thank you for hanging in there. Carrie and Tom, are you hearing me now? Yes? Okay, good. 
Um, so this slide uh, represents the uh, some of the the cover graphics, and then of course the first cover with uh, when Intenza took over, expressing the idea of the architecture. So basically, the broad strokes idea of the case study house program was to um, uh, to be like uh, an experiment, uh, experimental uh, proving ground for kind of new modern architectural ideas within the context of uh, of the common American lifestyle, uh, and to kind of bridge the gap between some of the forward-thinking architectural designers uh, that were beginning to do work at that time, uh, especially on the West Coast, and uh, everyone in America who might be interested in kind of following it and being a part of it. And it really blew up, of course, after the war, because all of a sudden we had um, all kinds of factories that uh, originally uh, that, you know, it was kind of uh, toward the end or of uh, the Industrial Revolution. And we had all these factories that had been tooled for production of stuff for the war. And now they needed something new to do. So they started making cool uh, new architectural materials, some of them not so good, some of them, some of them we now regret and we're kind of replacing. But it was a fun, innovative, forward-thinking time. And with what was going on in Europe too, uh, a lot of people were, there was kind of a distaste in our mouths about being uh, directly or intimately reminded of our European roots. Uh, and there was this sort of spirit of American ingenuity where we started thinking about how America would express itself differently at that time after the war. So. Uh, breaking rules, doing new things, experimenting with new forms and ideas, that was the mode of the day. And this magazine played a huge part in that. Um, and so what I wanted to do is, I'm gonna show two examples from the case study house program, which uh, originally there were like 30 something designs. Uh, not all of them were realized. Uh, some of them were realized and then have been uh, torn down. Some of them are still out there and you can visit. Um, I'm going to show two great examples uh, that that are that are two that I've experienced uh, personally. Then one that I think is a great example by Richard Neutra, who uh, is such a fixture in mid-century American architecture that I we, we can't have any talk without him. Um, and then I'm going to present one house that has nothing that was not included in the program by an architect who was not part of the program, and I'm not sure why he wasn't. I'm wondering if there was a scandal. And then. Um, I'm going to show you, uh, and we can talk a little bit about uh, a connection, how that, how the the mid-century uh, houses trickled down to uh, local architecture. We have a really great example in our community. There probably is more than one, but I'm going to show you a snapshot of one that you can see the relationship between what they were doing and what happened here. So, the first house that I wanted to feature is. Case study house number eight, which is the Eames House in Pacific Palisades. Um, let me ask how many of you are aware of the Eames House? Carrie is, Tom, no. Okay, if I say Charles and Ray Eames, do those names mean anything? Now more of us are nodding. So Charles and Ray were a husband and wife couple. Uh, who did all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, they have a prolific design career uh, and it's multidisciplinary, ranges from architecture to furniture. Um, they were futurists. She, uh, Ray was a painter. Uh, she worked with textiles. They designed cool ad campaigns for um, IBM and they were all over the place and it was always fun and cool. And so they were part of the program uh, and this example of, of the, the project that was the result of their collaboration with the magazine is unique in that they ended up being the people who lived in the house. So they were the designers and the tent, the residents, which is an interesting uh, experience to have. Um, and the site that was selected for their project was uh, a site in Pacific Palisades. And I did a Google uh, snapshot to show you to give you a sense of where it is you see the little pin here and you don't get a sense of the three-dimensionality of what's going on here but uh, this is the this is the house the rooftop and there's a meadow here and then there's an immediate uh, drop it's a pretty 
severe drop in grade, a bluff here down to the beach and then the ocean. So this is Pacific Palisades and then Santa Monica is just down here uh, around the corner. And so from this bluff, it's grown up a bit with trees now, but from the bluff originally, um, there's the edge of the ground and the ocean and the sky. So it was a pretty spectacular sight. And I understand that the Eameses um, had the property or had some time that they could spend on the property before the construction of the house. They used to go there and hang out for uh, weekend afternoons and have picnics, spent a lot of time just enjoying the property. And originally there was a collaboration and a design for the house where it would be located in the middle of the meadow. Um, and I, I don't remember the reason for the delay, but uh, the project was delayed long enough that when they revisited it, they'd spent enough more time on the site and learned or had the epiphany that they thought that would be a terrible mistake because they didn't want to take away um, the experience of the site. And by putting the house there, they kind of obliterated the nature of it. So that resulted in this change. Um, and, and part of why I wanted to uh, call your attention to that epiphany was because it really is indicative of the, the abstract idea that the house represents. Um, and I'm gonna skip ahead and maybe come back. This is a quote from the uh, magazine. This house represents uh, an attempt to state an idea rather than a fixed architectural pattern. And it is as an attitude toward living that we wish to present it. So just kind of wrap your head around that. If you're like me, it, you may need to do it slowly. So this house represents an attempt to state an idea rather than a fixed architectural pattern. And it is as an attitude toward living that we wish to present it. So this is, this is a physical space, a building that is made to represent an idea. That's new, right? Like how, how often when you're thinking about the architecture that you move through, exist in and use on a daily basis, do you think, what is the idea of this house? It's kind of a, it's a shift in paradigm for how you go about looking at what you're doing. And the house itself, um, is the physical constructed manifestation of that abstract concept. So, and along with that, they had the, uh, they had the intention to uh, research and use uh, what, what were becoming at that time readily available off the shelf pre-engineered standard building materials. So there was a catalog and you could actually just order these steel components uh, that are pre-engineered and they just ship to the site not unlike our modern day pre-engineered steel structures that, that uh, a lot of them are used around here, but whereas oftentimes we use them and then we try to, or we, um, we give them an appearance, kind of cover them up or make them look like something different. In this case, that structure is very openly and clearly expressed. So here's an interior image uh, and you can see out at the edge of the, this is the living room looking uh, at the bluff and, and to the ocean, again, now with trees, but uh, on the porch outside, you can see this open pre-engineered steel uh, truss structure. I just ordered that out of a catalog like Sears. Steel columns, all of these windows are industrial windows that are designed to go in a factory building but they're standard sizes, you just, they just ordered them and put them there. And where you have the solid panels, uh, it's basically relative to the interior program of the building. So uh, the end of the house is completely open like an oculus focused on the sea and the sky. And then on this side, um, you enter, so where you have more openness, there, it's relative to circulation and public space where you have more closed panels with, these are stucco over cement board off the shelf panels. 
where you have those, it's relative to a private interior space, or in this case, the upper part of the living room uh, where, you, where you don't physically occupy it. So the bottom part is open so you can see out, the upper part is not necessary to be open. So it's basically like, if you can imagine, like when we design our cars, it's like this is a machined object that we're going to conceptualize we're going to build it in a factory and then we're going to inhabit it it happens to move around but this is like an idea of a machine for living in um there's no overt ornamentation decoration it's more about the experience of the site it's a uh, it's offering sort of subtle support for the life that's going to happen in and around it um, the Eameses lived here, so it was a house and studio, and they lived here for uh, their whole lives. Charles died first, and then Ray continued to live there uh, on her own until she passed away, and then, of course, the house went and became the Eames Foundation. So if you're ever in Los Angeles, you can go see it. And let me tell you, so I've tried to be a little bit not editorial. Uh, when I saw this house in architecture school, um, I didn't know how to feel uh, the idea of it. I looked at it, I understood what, what, what the intention was from an academic perspective, but I was like, eh, I don't feel it because photographs won't work. When I went to the site, I had an entirely different experience. It's a really transcendent way to exist and live. So keep that in mind. And if you ever have an occasion to go or go on YouTube and watch some videos that some people have posted, maybe it's closer, but it's still not like being there. So I'm curious, thought any thoughts, questions? Uh, what about the Eames house? Can you hear Melissa saying she likes it? I like the openness. Like how boxy. I love the repetition of the, the squares, the rectangles and squares. That's the way you work when you're uh, pulling things off a shelf and it, using standard materials. And actually, I I am I usually <coughs> use a structural grid even when I'm doing wood frame design and construction. We have um, we have a 16 inch module that uh, you can break down the length of studs, the width of plywood panels. And sometimes I'm doing that because I'm lazy and I don't want to cut anything. Flat loops are always great for lighting, but at least it has the little lines in it. So I'm, it's yeah, it's, and that's actually a structural steel deck. And I'm glad you brought up the idea of the flat roof because I wanted to speak to that. It's a real shame that we, at least locally, we get more rain than they do in this climate. But locally, uh, there isn't a really great material that we can use for flat or flat-ish roofs that is affordable and available to most people. So if any of you out there who might be listening to this would like a billion dollar idea, I'm just giving you one. Figure out a way to help people afford a flat roof that drains water for the same cost as it would take to put a ugly metal roof on top of a flat roof building. There it is, figure it out. I won't even ask for credit. <laughs> Hello, Ruth. Hello. Number two. The stall house, case study house number 22 is the stall house in Hollywood Hills. In looking at this image, uh, is anybody familiar with this project? At least not that you're aware of. It's in the movies all the time. Okay, Ruth says it's in the movies all the time. And she's right. And that's one of the things I was gonna express. So I'm just gonna skip ahead. <laughs> this is uh, from The Simpsons. That's the stall house. And interestingly, another project that I'm gonna show you in a moment, it was formerly owned by one of the co-creators of The Simpsons. So this is obviously someone who is aware of design and architecture and uh, and that kind of appeared as a theme in the series. So um, this is maybe my favorite 
house ever. Uh, it's certainly my favorite house, personal, personal favorite as part of the case study house program. It has become one of the most iconic project, how, residential projects in the world, and it's in all kinds of movies and ad campaigns, and um, it's absolutely a transcendent experience. So that's me there. Um, the, the house is available for private tour. You have to book in advance, so uh, be aware of that if you go. So this one is in Hollywood Hills, and you can see the little pin here. Um, this is Sunset Boulevard. The, all the typical Hollywood touristy stuff is down this way a little bit. So there's a pretty significant rise in uh, topography right along this edge. And uh, during the time period when this house was conceptualized and designed as part of the program, they were doing lots of development in the hills. Um, and the, to drive in them is quite interesting. Uh, I would say fun and entertaining. These are very, very narrow roads, very windy. Um, it's very difficult to have two cars pass each other. You kind of have to hit the ditch. Um, but of course you have this amazing view of the valley and when, when the air is really clear, you can see the water. Um, so one of the interesting things about this site and this project is that the site was basically considered unusable by most people. Uh, it, there wasn't very much flat, available flat land uh, to build a pad on. Um, it dropped off pretty significantly from the street. And so that's actually the only way that Mr. Stahl was able to afford the property. He was um, an, an, uh, sort of a middle-class mid-level executive at a manufacturing company, he and his family. So they weren't wealthy and a lot of the development in the hills at that time, it was going to people who could afford these premium sites, you know, up on the side of the hills. So he got the site because it was cheap because no one thought they could do anything with it. And as part of the case study house program, they engaged Peter Keenig. Um, sometimes you'll see his name as Pierre. Uh, who was a brilliant uh, designer of the era. He also taught, I think, at University of Southern California in architecture school. And he, he did this house and maybe at least one other uh, in the case study house program. So the, the thing that made this work was a pretty spectacular feat uh, with, the, with the foundation structure. It's a cantilevered action. Uh, if I use that word, is that so? Basically, it, it has something that's anchoring it deep within the hillside, and then uh, the structure is able to uh, defy gravity and reach out and, and support the living space uh, in the living room. So that's why when you see me standing here, you have very little relationship with the ground, and you can see this ornamental grass here, but, and it's kind of deceiving in the image that's really far away. So when you're standing there inside, you have no connection with the earth. You're just like floating in the sky. Um, beyond that mechanism, it's an extremely simple steel structure. Uh, again, a structural steel deck. The interior is largely open and uninterrupted. This is a, an iconic image by Julius Schulman, who was, a, he photographed a lot of the houses for the project and was an amazing mid-century architectural photographer. Uh, and then jumping to this one, the kitchen, uh, you can see it actually looks like a, a contemporary kitchen. Uh, very, very functional kitchen, open living space. And I didn't show you the plan. Uh, you can look up a copy, uh, but you, you, you enter the living room by walking past the master bedroom and there's one kid's room. So you're walking across the pool terrace the, from the car parking area, which I think I have a photo. Oh, I didn't upload it. So you park um, here and then walk across this bridge. So the master bedroom is to your left and then you walk past the kids room, which is to your left. Then you cross another bridge and then you enter into this main living space. So to get to the master bedroom, you go through the kids room. Interesting. But they had a, they had a different level of priority for what they wanted to do. So the structure itself is as simple as you could possibly imagine. 
but they have this inspiring connection to the ocean, the sky, the valley, the landscape. It reminds me of this, one of my favorite quotes from The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. This is the last line of the book, which I told you I always remember the last line. Yeah, so you remember uh, Dominic, Dominic, she's going up in the elevator to the big tower and she gets off and she, this is it. The, then there was only the ocean and the sky and the figure of Howard Rourke. So, I just want to ask us to conceptualize like relative to other living spaces that you have inhabited and how they influence and impact your life experience in subtle ways on a daily basis. Can you start to imagine in a cumulative way, like how the space around you can affect your experience? Tell me what you feel about this idea, this thing I said to you. Hi, hey, Amy. Well, um, you feel kind of uh, small in comparison because you can see out so far around everything um, and that you're just a small part of that bigger picture. But also you're up above it so you can really see it all well. But it's beautiful and um, it, um, strange to live like that right? <laughs> so that's an interesting point so strange relative i'm gonna let me repeat what I mean, getting used to I mean, i'm sure you get used to living there but yeah what melissa was saying was that uh, it it maybe would make her feel small because she would be so aware of the immensity of it uh, on such a regular basis but also remember that she it reminds her that she's a part of something that's bigger um so relative to living environments where you're not connected to nature in this way, it's strange. Um, because there are other homes that are very uh, sort of dark, cozy, womb-like. I mean, some people will look at an image like this and say, oh, I could never live there. Um, it's too cold. It doesn't feel homey, you know, those kinds of things. And I'm not discounting that. I'm just kind of making an observation. Yes, and sometimes people define that as a, a need. I put a glass uh, room on the back of my house in Garland, and my mother-in-law, Elizabeth, and Eleanor's granny just could not understand how I was going to live with that because at her house, you had blinds, you had shears, and then you had drapes on top. And, you know, it's like, how are you going to put drapes out there? And I'm like, I'm not. Well, people can see in. And I said, how unfortunate for them should they happen to <laughs> go into my backyard. You know? <laughs> did you, Tom and Amy, did you guys get some of that from Ruth? She's talking about the glass room she put on the back of her house. Um, yeah. Garland. Okay. It was 12 by 14. So it wasn't a small room, mm -hmm. you know, and it was a, I mean, it opened directly into the living space. So it made it, and we were on Duck Creek. So you saw the limestone walls and the trees in the evening. The limestone walls were very bright and the trees were very dark, you know, and at night it was like there was a black hole there. I'm the same way. The first thing I do in the morning is throw open all the curtains, all the blinds, everything's open. And the last thing I do before I go to bed is close all of that. So um, the other 17, 18 hours of the day, it's all wide open. So yeah, I like the light. Yeah, I, I can't stand being in a dark room. We're, we're that way at our house too. Uh, I, I relate to what you're saying and I agree, except in my case, um, I actually never close anything. Uh, I, I'm kind of in a situation where, you know, for instance, in my bedroom, I have corner windows looking out into a portion of the backyard with shrubs. So I kind of feel uh, enclosed and protected by the landscaping. Uh, I also don't parade around to, to uh, uh, distress people with my naked body, but I feel, I feel stifled if, uh, if I remain in an interior space with no kind of 
visual connection to nature and sunlight and that kind of thing. My mother was the same way. And somebody asked her once, well, what if somebody looks in and you're walking around? You know, she said, well, they'll probably only do that once. <laughs> and then they'll never do that again. Yeah, so, that's not really your problem unless you decide that you're concerned about it. So yeah, that's right. So I wanted to present the, this one and then in the next one in contrast to it. And, and actually where our conversation is, has gone is, uh, is a good segue. So this is a representation of the work of Richard Neutra, N-E-U-T-R-A. Had anyone heard of him? No? So I think he immigrated from Germany. Uh, so part of his architectural education was in Germany. Uh, he came to the United States. But he, he was pretty prolific, uh, especially in California during this period. Uh, he did work in other parts of the country, too. He has a beautiful house in Pennsylvania, I think. Um, but relative to the two examples that we've looked at so far, this house, which is situated in one of the valleys um, in sort of in Bel Air, uh, feels more like down to earth, um, grounded. And so you can kind of start to see a spectrum of what people were doing, whereas with the stall house, it was literally an open glass box with no solid planes. Uh, this one uh, gives you a little bit more of a sense of enclosure while still maintaining that connection to the California landscape. So this is the view from the street, the one on this opening, the view on the opening slide, and then the main entrance. This is very small, uh, very efficient interior space. So you can see in this slide uh, where the back, the back of the house really opens up with lots of glass to the landscape. Um, and I don't know as much about this one. I haven't visited it. It was recently restored and sold for $16 million. But I think there is another house on the property. It's a pretty obnoxious mansion relative to this one. Uh, oh, and this is the one that was owned by the co-creator of The Simpsons. Oh, gosh. Um, we'll have to answer that question a different way. Uh, 40s or 50s is the the typical time frame. Here's one of the earlier images of it. So Neutra was really well known for kind of really rational, simple uh, post and beam uh, wood structures. And at that time, uh, unfortunately, they were still in the mode of harvesting the ancient redwood uh, to use for construction. Um, and so they've learned to kind of cut back on that and control it and be more sustainable. It was a really great building material uh, for some of these California houses, um, but much more intimate, down to earth. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you all will agree. It feels more more cozy, right? Um, not quite so. It's focused in a different way. If you ask, so what is this house about? It's um, it's like really being grounded and earthy uh, relative to the other one. So then, but the next one that I'm going to show, which is not part of the case study house program, which, which, which was designed by John Lautner, is the Schaefer House, which is in Glendale, um, which is a bit out of LA uh, in the valley. Um, so this guy, John Lautner, who did some pretty spectacular googie, sculptural googie architecture, one house called the Chemosphere which is, looks like a tree house made out of a concrete pole. And it's like, it looks like a spaceship actually. Um, but this to me feels like uh, really, again, really grounded and even more organic. Uh, he worked with Frank Lloyd Wright. I know we know that name. So I feel a little bit of the influence of, uh, of Wright in the way that the structure here is expressed. On the interior, you see uh, all this rich wood tones, the exposed ceiling joists, uh, the masonry, and an amazing hearth uh, centrally located, big fireplace. This house was featured, has anyone seen the film A Single Man by Tom Ford? No? Oh, please, please, please watch that as soon as possible. Or 
if anyone listening would like to fund Ghost Town and we will buy the, what's the license called to show films? Oh, I have one of those. We can fund okay, Melissa, uh, we're partnering with the Sherman Library so we can have a screening. Yeah, thank you. So Tom Ford is the fashion designer who, of course, we all know, famous, really beautiful, uh, well-tailored men's clothing. Maybe he does women's clothing, too. I don't know. Um, he, started, he started his creative career by studying architecture at the University of Austin. Then he moved into fashion, and he became a filmmaker by creating the film A Single Man by Tom Ford, which stars Colin Firth and Julianne Moore. It's exquisitely photographed, and this house is uh, the setting, the home of the central character. So we'll have to put that on our agenda for stuff to do coming up. Um, so I just wanted to put that in to show a spectrum of things, and maybe someone will be inspired to figure out why Lautner wasn't included in the case study house program. I'm curious. He was in California during that time period. So here's the connection to uh, Sherman. Can you see that? Ruth, do you know this project? It's set on, on Tesla. You're not going to, you maybe aren't going to believe when I tell you. It's off Center Street. Oh, is that Dennis's house? Oh. So this is a post and beam wood framed modernist masterpiece in Sherman. And you can see this is an early image of it uh, where the. From the backyard, I think. Well, it's sort no, of the it's, back. There's the part, it's the front yard. This is the front yard. On the back of the house, cantilevers uh, off the side of the hill. The back of the house has a lot more glass than this side. Uh, it's very it's spectacular. It's like it's a tree house. This is an earlier image with the brightly painted uh, panel system, uh, which was all the rage, the thing to do uh, in, in modern architecture in that time period. classic bird orange yellow and avocado green, sure. I don't see the green, but I see the burnt orange. They probably had some green inside. Harvest gold. Yeah. Burnt orange and harvest gold. So this thing sort of lightly rests on the landscape, cantilevers off the hill, uh, op open to nature, strong connection to nature. And the original owner of this house, so this house was commissioned by Raymond Thomas. We spoke about him in the first week of the series where we talked about modern Sherman. Raymond Thomas was the designer. It was originally designed to have the capacity to be two floors. The second floor would have been similar to this um, in its architectural form. This window is, no, these windows, this bank of windows, uh, the entry door is just around this corner. This bank of windows is relative to a staircase down to a small basement and a parking area below this end of the house. So there would have been another stair over that one that would, that would have taken you up to the other floor. The man who commissioned this uh, house by Raymond Thomas uh, built it himself uh, with his bare hands out of available materials. So I think it's a pretty spectacular example a lot of people don't know about here, but I like to, I like the idea of pointing out the connection because, you know, it's interesting to me to observe social phenomenon and see how people are inspired to things. You know, as we're now living in Sherman in this modern era, how do we individually, uh, what are our reference points? How do we determine our style? One of the great things that was said about the the magazine, the Art and Architecture magazine and the Case Study House program um, was that they treated taste as a subject of critical debate and maintained high-minded concern for the elevation of standards. Ooh. Treated taste, I can't remember, I'm not gonna get it wrong. They treated taste as a subject of critical debate 
So how do you decide, how did I decide I was gonna wear this obnoxiously ugly paisley shirt today? I mean, those are the kinds of style decisions that we make on a regular basis. What, what are we looking at? How are we deciding uh, what, how we're going to express ourselves? In this time period, arts and architecture uh, was an influential, influential voice uh, that everybody was looking at, uh, including Raymond Thomas and Mr. Didimore and Sherman. So that's what I have for the case study house program. Thoughts, questions, ideas, inspirations. So I think no, oh, okay. I think it was published until like 1967 ish. So the guy that took over that made it really great retired and moved on to another adventure. Someone took over and, and it made it five more years under that new direction and then it stopped. But then they rebooted it, I think in the eighties for a little while and then it stopped again. I've also learned that um, Tashin is a publisher. Tashin um, is publishing a book with uh, a number of the first series of, of the publication and then they're planning to publish a, another book that has the next part. So that's one that I would love to have uh, and maybe you can acquire it at the library. So it's like, it's like all of the, the number of the first however many in one book together republished. Now with regards to the case study houses, uh, if you go to Wikipedia, which of course is my favorite resource and it knows everything and it's always right, um, you can go there and, and if you search for case study houses, you can see a cumulative list. You can see the ones that are built and unbuilt. And then you can download a PDF section uh, where they published uh, about each of the houses. So that might be fun and worth looking at if you're interested in more follow-up. Hey, Jared. Yes. I was just going to say, you mentioned the Tashin publications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I found a little place um, that has them like really inexpensively. Um, they're, they're, they're great. And these two just, I happen to pick up, you know, on architecture. Yes. Um, little monographs. Yeah. I think they were like $15. So they may have them on some of the ones you were mentioning, but when you said that, I thought, I know what he's talking about. Yes. So, where, where did you get those? Um, I guess they're not open right now, but there's a place called um, Neighborhood Goods down in um, Legacy West in Plano. And they have, it, it's kind of like a department store, but not really because they have all these little pop-up stores within them. And one of them is this Tashin. There's a whole like pop-up kind of, not a kiosk, bigger than that. I don't know what you would call it. A little section um, with all these Tashin books. And they had a bunch of these architecture ones. And like I said, I think they were $15. So. Well, that's a good price. I'm sure Amazon has them too. Uh, so if we can't wait until the virus is over, maybe we have to order. I think I have some ta some books published by Tashin now that you yeah. mentioned, mentioned, mentioned it. Anyway, but. just thought I'd throw that out there. Cool, thank you. So is anybody um, inspired? Do you, you ready to build your glass box? Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? No, I'm ready for you to build it for me. <laughs> um, I'd be glad to. Well, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I, I kind of... Oh. Is that you, Carrie, trying to say something? <laughs> we didn't get any, any of that. <laughs> oh, you're back. Okay, yeah, so I probably just... I've been driving, so uh, yes, I agree with Tom that you can build it. You can design and build it for us. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, like that. I like that plan, yeah. Oddly enough, the property near that house in Sherman, uh, which is up from, what park is it? Binkley? Binkley. Uh, yes. Binkley. Binkley park, uh, there are lots for sale. So if you can find a funding source to have a case study community, then you can have a house. Yes, and I'm sorry that David Baca isn't here, and I don't think, I don't think it matters if I say 
he's somehow involved in that. Uh, I don't know at what degree, but there are some plans for, so the original, if you look at the original plat for, for where the, the Didymore house is built, um, you'll notice that there are several lots there. Uh, there was originally a plan for a sort of modernist enclave at that location. This was the only house that was realized. And so um, I think that there, there are some plans in the works. I guess it's, I've seen the listing on, on yeah. you sent it to me. Yeah. There's a listing uh, for the property. So maybe we'll see something cool happening there. And uh, you all can, uh, we'll, we, I will build your glass house boxes um, at that location for you. And I'll just let you know when they're ready. So, so um, actually I feel good because we're sort of on time today. I've been trying to learn how long it takes to present something around an hour. So I very much appreciate everyone who joined us today. Um, we will do this every Friday and talk about something fun and cool. And if you have any inspiration for a topic, uh, either that you would like to find someone to speak on or that you would like to present. Uh, I would love to uh, receive that inspiration. Uh, we've already had some good conversations with the participants so far about stuff that we were going to do in the future. Um, once the COVID thing is over, remember that uh, we would love for you to consider joining us in the gallery with your bag lunch uh, anytime that you can. So it's kind of a cool hangout and chat session. Uh, what else? Hey, Jared, the, yes, you've recorded this, right? And it will be posted somewhere. Okay, I need to look and see if I pushed an appropriate button on the Zoom, but I know that we're recording the Facebook Live. And so if I didn't do the right thing on Zoom, I'll make sure that I share the Facebook version. Is that okay, a, awesome. an acceptable answer? And thank you for asking that because I need to make sure I do a better job at, at I don't know where that checkbox is. I know I've seen it before, so I'll take a look. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sounds great, thank you. You are welcome. All right, uh, thank you all for joining me. Uh, enjoy uh, your winding down. Hopefully uh, it, you've had a successful week on Friday afternoon. Enjoy your weekend and I'll see you here again next Friday if you can join us. Great. Thanks again. You're welcome. Arrivederci. Mm, <laughs> Kathleen's